story in John chapter 2 verses 1 to 11. The message there is not to consume wine. It is far, far beyond it. Because the Bible says the word of God is for exaltation, for correction in righteousness, that we might be thoroughly equipped. God's word is an instrument to us that empowers us to be more like God. So we want to decode what happened in what we can learn from John 4. John chapter 4 verses 1 to 24. So the Bible tells us that Jesus is moving from Judea to go to Galilee and he passed through Samaria. He could have taken another route but he chose to pass through Samaria. So these people in Samaria are called Samaritans. So we have in this story the Jews and the Samaritans. We know the Jews who are the Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans are a race of people that from history down, the Jews due to one circumstance or the other, due to... Um, they are being conquered by some of the Roman emperors, had to intermarry with some set of people, and the people that resorted to it are the Samaritans. So they are half Jews, but they are not pure breed. Because they are not pure Jews, the Jews have nothing to do with them. According to the words of the woman, you know, the woman telling Jesus, yeah, that um, verse 9, for the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans, you know, and um, you will also recall that the woman called Jacob her father. The woman called Jacob her father, verse 12, Are thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself? So the Jews, the Samaritans have a tie to the Jews. They have a tie because they are half Jews. But the Jews don't do, have nothing to do with them because they are, they are not pure breed. They are not pure Jews. They have nothing to do with them because they are not pure Jews. So that's the first point of this teaching. Every Christian is a Christian. Every child of God is a child of God. There is a basic thing. There are two human races in this world. In the physical sense, we have one human race. But in the spiritual sense, we have two sets of people of God and the non-children of God. And we will observe that in the eye of our Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't see the Samaritans as a second-hand person. He saw them exactly the way he created them. They are also image bearers of God. So, the first point we learn as we meet believers, what should unite us with them is the love of Jesus they have in their hearts. And nothing should separate us from them. We should show them love like we show our fellow Christians love. You know, like I said before, we are all standing on a bigger platform that is bigger than our local church. And that is more important than our local church. And that is the fact that we are all children of God. We are all the body of Christ. This is a vital lesson for us to learn. When we read later down, even the disciples were surprised that Jesus was talking to the woman. 
verse 27. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man asked. Now, it is some commentary said Jesus, um, at this time, a man was not allowed to speak freely with a woman in the open. Talk less of a Jew speaking with a Samaritan. That's why the, the disciples themselves were, were sort of surprised that he was speaking with the woman. That's the very first thing we can learn here. The second thing we can learn here is Jesus addresses this woman in a very interesting way. I want us to know that God knows everything. And I'm sure before Jesus Christ got to this well, he knew the woman was going to come. And he just chose to use that opportunity to minister to this woman. And for those of us that desire to speak to some people about Jesus, that desire to speak, tell those that have not heard about the love of God and the gift of God. We have something to learn here. Jesus Christ tells the woman to give her a drink. She tells the woman to give her a drink. There is the vision of God for us and that is we should encounter him on a daily basis. As we encounter him on a daily basis, as we praise him and pray to him and meditate on his word, he would gradually give us strength, give us grace, give us enablement to continue in our work with him. And this woman encountered Jesus at this very time that this story was written. So, Jesus requests this woman to give her something to drink. Now, before we analyze this encounter, we are told in verse 6, the woman came at midday. Sixth hour, they always count the hours from 6 a.m. So the woman came at midday. In the Middle East, around this time, the sun is burning. The sun is very hot. It is not a favorable time that people go out to fetch water. They either go early in the morning or later in the day when the sun is down. But the woman came at midday. That tells us possibly she didn't want every other person to be there when she was fetching water. But Jesus met her still. And it was a good thing there was nobody there to distract Jesus. So Jesus requests her to give her a drink. To give him a drink. So, we can learn from this. The Bible says that the eye of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. Jesus expects us, not that we can give him drink to quench our thirst, but spiritually for us who have been blessed by God. God looks forward to our daily fellowship. He looks forward to our prayers and praises, be it at midnight like Paul and Silas did, or be it in the day like Joshua and the Israelites did at Jericho. Irrespective of the time that we choose to minister to him, he expects us to be about that duty. Just like John 7, 38 says it, he says, 
that whosoever believeth in him, Jesus, out of him shall flow rivers of living water. We can encounter Jesus in our home on a daily basis. In fact, we do encounter him on a daily basis when we take time to praise him and pray to him. We take time to worship him. We take time to read his word and meditate on it and by so doing, renew and reorientate our mind. That is the desire that the Holy Spirit expects to work within us so that we are able by his grace to walk in our journey with God. So, We would see the reaction of the woman. Why are you a Jew asking me for water? You people originally have no dealings with us. As Christians, we have been called to shine as light. And the Bible says, He who wins a soul is wise. In any situation we find ourselves, let's know that there is a message we are relaying with our life. Either we relay the message of the love of God through our behavior, or we relay the message of, oh, all men are sinners. There is no difference among men. We only have people that desire to prove themselves godly or people that have accepted that they are sinners, there is nothing they can do. There is a message we relay out in every situation we find ourselves. But God expects us by His Spirit, by His help, to relay the message of love to those that have not heard about Jesus. Because as his light, as his representative on earth, God expects us to shine as light, to give somebody Jesus that does not have him, because that is the only life. That is the true life that matters. Every other life without Jesus is a meaningless life. And sometimes the response we might have from people, from people is of rejection. The apostles were rejected as they were preaching. So you will not be the first person that will be rejected. The world will reject us. They might call us all sorts of names because we are children of God, because we have chosen not to play along with what they are doing or we have chosen to be different. Let's rejoice in that because he did it to our Savior. And let's rejoice in that because you will know that the word you have been telling them is making an impact. You know, I, a friend of mine that is an American I have been telling about Jesus for ages. Finally, someone called to block me off. I've rejoiced in that because I know the words I've been telling him is having impact. So he has come to a point where he decides for Jesus or he decides to silence this person. He can silence me as a person, but he will not be able to silence the Holy Spirit. You know, so this woman makes this statement to sort of put Jesus off. But he didn't know he was dealing with the maker of his soul. And then Jesus again keeps the game up. Now, she's, Jesus is trying to minister to this woman. And to win this woman's soul, Christ must take her through the proper route, through the proper processes and the same thing we have to do the woman has opened up now 
she is asking why Jesus as a Jew is asking her for water. But we observe from verse 10, Jesus completely ignores that statement, moves on, and says, talks about the gift of God and the living water. And he even goes ahead and says, this water you are drinking, tomorrow you will be thirsty, you will still come back and fetch. But the water I will give you, you will never ever taste. What a brilliant way. The woman was referring to physical water and Jesus Christ was referring to eternal life that quenches the test, the eternal test that we have. And the truth is, when we look at this life, we know that the only thing that can give us peace, lasting peace, is to know Jesus. Money will not give us peace. Those that have it are committing suicide. So physical things will not give us peace because like they say, you can buy bread, a very expensive bed, but you cannot buy sleep. You know, you can buy all the fitness equipment, but you cannot buy health. You can buy all the multivitamins, but you cannot by health. So the true and lasting life, the blessings of God that add no sorrow comes from only Jesus Christ. So not to waste any time, Jesus by spirit hits the nail on the head. What does Jesus what is Jesus trying to do to this woman? Jesus Christ is trying to bring this woman to repentance. And having talking about eternal life, water of life and things like that, Jesus now tells her exactly in verse 16 to 18 about her sinful ways by a very interesting wisdom. Go and call your husband. And the woman says, I have no husband. And um, thank God the woman was not smart on Jesus by saying, ah, ah, sir, I'm at the well now. Before I go home and bring my husband, I don't think you can wait. It will take a long time. The woman was not able to dodge that. The Spirit of God comes within us to try to make us conform to Jesus. The Spirit of God comes within us to try to make us become like Jesus. And the only way He can do that is by revealing the things that we are doing that we ought not to be doing. It is only the Spirit of God that can do that. Now, Jesus Christ here is the Word of God according to John 1. Every person has to trust in God. Are you a preacher on the pulpit or you are somebody talking to your friend about Jesus? You give them the Word and trust in God to convict them of the sin. This woman has had five husbands. She is obviously adulterous. God is against this particular sin. But it is the Spirit of God that will convict men of their sin. Our own duty is to speak the word of God to them. The duty of God it is, of the Holy Spirit it is, to convict men of sin. When we as men take up the duty of condemning people of their sins, we might not get the results. We have not, as preachers, been called to condemn, but we have been called to proclaim the word of God.
Thou shalt not commit adultery is a sin again. Is 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 a sin in the scriptures. And even Jesus modified it or updated it by saying, Oh, the physical act is not just the sin. The thought in the heart, the thought in the mind is already sinful. That's our duty to proclaim and nothing else. It's our duty not only to proclaim but also to use that word to heal us. To strengthen us. Because Christ is in the process of preparing us for himself. We are his bride. He is our bridegroom. The Spirit is preparing us for himself. So it's of, necessary, it's of great necessity that we not only focus on learning the word of God for ourselves, but learning the word of God to grow so as to Tell somebody else that is dying about it. It is a vital thing for us to do, to grow in the spirit of wisdom. It is a vital thing for us to do. Let us observe, Jesus did not in any way condemn this woman. Not in any way. He only told her, yes, you have no husband, but I know you've had five. So that to let her know that the law of God condemns it. Since she knows Jacob, then she will definitely know of the Ten Commandments. The law of God condemns it. The same way I want to speak to us. As many of us as are in Christ are not condemned. As long as we allow that word change our mind and eventually change our practice, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. What do I mean by that? Now, if within us we have joy that Christ has died for us, He has saved us from our sins, that's a very good thing. And the evidence to that, among other things, is we do certain things or say certain things and we are convicted that these things are wrong because they are sin against God. We have every reason to rejoice because indeed the Bible says that even if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. The Holy Spirit will not condemn us because we are His children and we are not perfect. And we are honest and sincere and we take up the duty of reading his word, using that word on ourselves and asking God to help us to grow from the childish things that we are still doing. Happy are we, but we have to ensure we don't give room to any condemnation. The devil will try to condemn us. The time we get angry and say and do or do something we ought not to. Yeah, those words somehow cannot be taken back. But we need to repent of it, from it and move on. And learn to forgive ourselves too. Because since God has forgiven us, who are we not to forgive ourselves? And let us ensure that the enemy does not hold us down through conviction. Condemnation, I mean. Because when we fall into sin, the Bible says, if the righteous fall seven times, he will rise again. The devil might try to keep us in that sin by saying, oh, you, you can never make it. Forget it. It's not possible. If everybody is a Christian, you can never be. Have you been tempted like that, my brother and sister? replied that word and said, Oh, I can be because I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. I can be because Jesus Christ died for me on the cross and his resurrection power is at work within me. God is still working in me. I'm not going to give up because God is not giving up on me. Let us not allow any condemnation. 
The same story we see in John 8, the woman caught in adultery. Jesus says there straight away, Neither do I condemn you, but what? Go and sin no more. Christ has come to convict us of our sins, but not to condemn us. However, if there is a consistent and persistent habitual sin that has gotten a hold of us, and this sin is consistently being practiced without any restraint, then we have a reason to go to God and pray and ask Him to forgive us and show mercy and give us power to break away from the sin. The Spirit of God is within us to help us to teach us, to give us everything we need to experience true sonship. To experience true sonship. Because through the evidence of true sonship, the evidence of being a true child of God is the principle of laboring to please God. First John 3. He who has this hope in him purifies himself even as his spell. The children of God do everything with the help of the Holy Spirit to live a righteous life. Because we know that it is our sinful nature that sent Jesus to the cross. Yeah, these things can become a bit tricky, that we are not perfect, we still sin, and that Christ has forgiven us. It can become a bit tricky. But here is the difference. As long as our heart rejoices in God, that Jesus died and saved us, and we feel sorrow and pain for sinful actions and thoughts, we are different from the other person that outwardly does everything like a Christian. Maybe preaches, sings, does Bible study, but when that person is away from church environment, all those activities are laid aside. He lives the normal sinful life. The conscience the conviction, he has left it at the door in the church. He talks more ungodly. He thinks more wicked. He is he's more sinful than the sinner. With such a person, that person needs to pray to God to help him. Because that person will eventually be rejected by God. That person will eventually be rejected. This is what we see again and again and again in the scriptures. Matthew 7, Jesus Christ says, He says, I will say to them, I think 2021, 20, I never knew you depart from me, ye that walk in equity. And the Apostle Paul says it in Corinthians, in Galatians. You know, let's turn to Galatians. Galatians 5. So, Galatians 5, from 19, he lists down, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. The works of the flesh means the evidence of the activities of the sinful nature in us. That what it means, the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. He lists them, and so, and so, and so. Verse 21, he says, as I have also told you in time past, that they we do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. These things are being practiced by them. Because there is a principle of sin that still works in them. That person has not been saved. 
and the evidence that that person has not been saved is the conviction of the law of God is not there. It is not. We probably have met people like that. They are a pastor or whatever and they live very sinful lives. It's easy for them to be deceived because they believe because what they are doing, God must accept them. I'm preaching in church, so God must accept me even though I'm an adulterer. No! The devil can preach to somebody. There is nothing that a man naturally does by the help of the spirit that the devil cannot counterfeit. Nothing. Let's remember when Moses went before Pharaoh. And Moses threw down his sword, his, his staff, and he turned out to snake. What did the magicians of Pharaoh do? They did the same thing. And God only showed himself superior by swallowing, allowing Pharaoh's snake to swallow, um, Moses' snake to swallow the other snakes. It must have been God because one snake swallowing all the other snakes, that must have been God. So it is not the deeds that we do. It is the spirit within us that is operating. It is the ability within us. To know that Christ has saved me. This thing is wicked in his sight. This is evil. I must fight against it. This is evil. To be unnecessarily angry and get out of control. It is evil. It is ungodly. And the man in the house, but God has called me to love my wife as Christ loved the church. God has called me. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger. So because I'm the man in the house, does not give me rights. To get out of control in anger. That is evil, that is sinful, that is wicked. Because every disobedience to God's word is sin. To him that knoweth to do right and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And the Holy Spirit is there to help us convicted of this sin. For this particular person, the devil might deceive him. Ah, it's your nature, you, can, you can't control it. Have you ever seen anybody getting angry in church? Or that person is going for an interview. They want to employ you as the director general of a company. And somebody annoys you. Maybe you got a phone call of somebody that annoyed you or something. And in that interview, you just flared up. Who does that? What will he do? He will do everything to... Or... He's in the house. His children are being children and he's getting extremely angry. And he's very close. Pastor calls him. And he picks up the phone. Ah, hello, Pastor. How are you doing, sir? Immediately all that anger would be suspended and he would talk like a normal person. To the point that even the children would say, ah. So you mean that he can be this self-controlled? The issue of anger is something we ought to know. Is only God that can help us. The same way with our work with God. It's only God can help us. Nobody can help us. Finally, God was able to get through to this woman. And the woman takes off. Goes to the towns and starts to shout. You know, in the in the Jewish days, this was uncalled for for women. But something, this woman had an encounter that made her leave her water pot there and went to the city and said, "Come and meet a man that have told me everything about me." And the interesting thing is, the same thing this woman was ashamed of. She began to proclaim it to people. This woman has, this man has told me everything evil and sinful I've been doing. Can this be the Messiah? Indeed, our encounter of Jesus 
makes us bold. I pray that will be our experience on a daily basis. Makes us bold. Not just privately, but publicly. To speak for him. To throw caution to the wind and tell people about Jesus. This woman was bold. She went. And speaks. Well, Jesus revealed himself to him, to her, says I'm the Messiah. Because she said when the Messiah comes, we would, um, we would know more about him. And Jesus said, oh, you've seen me. I'm the one here talking to you. I pray that God will give us the blessing of experiencing him on a regular basis because that is the only thing that can change us. Second Corinthians. On a regular basis. My prayer is that God would give us his encounter on a regular basis. Let us pray. Time is already gone. Father, I thank you, Lord. I give you praise for this little word that we've heard. It could have only been you that is able to 